So joining me now at the Happy Place Festival is none other than Tom Daly and Lance Black. Gentlemen, how are you? Hello, we're, you know, we're doing good. Yeah, it's, holding in there. It's getting like, it's kind of surreal how we've had like the best summer weather-wise ever on the, in the history of what I can remember. <laughs> yeah, we've all been stuck inside, but you know, making the most of whatever time we can in the sunshine. True. We, 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 spring, right? This is spring. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we've, we've, we've had... Summer. We've had worse summers than this, so yeah. <laughs> we're all right. Yeah, we was, I've been saying to a few friends, I think it would have been a very different experience for everyone had it been in the depths of winter here. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. It'd have been yeah. tough. No, it's um, very true. How, how have you found, how have you found the, the last couple of months then? Because I know you, you've, you've got your little boy as well. So has it been kind of climatising to, you know, the last eight weeks or has it kind of been all right? Um, I mean, for me, I, it's a bit less lonely because I, uh, when I'm in my writing phase, I, I'm locked down anyway, and usually I'm home alone. And now I can, you know, hear footsteps, little pitter patter of a, a two year old's footsteps above, or, uh, you know, I can, I get to have lunch with my husband and, you know, it's nice. It's not so bad. I'm lucky in that way, but I, I'd be lying if I said anxiety didn't come into play. Of course, you know, there is that anxiety of what's actually going on out there and how it's affecting some of our loved ones who, who uh, you know, whose health means that they might be more, even more at risk. Uh, so that's, wor that's all worrisome and it creates anxiety and we have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and I would say for the most part, we deal with it or I deal with it by uh, eating things made of sugar and with plenty of fat in them. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, the thing is, I, for me, it's probably the, been the biggest change in day-to-day -day life because, you know, I'm normally, you know, up 6.15, we are up with Robbie, Robbie's having his breakfast, then I'm out the door to go to, go to training, and then I'm at training all day, I get back around like 4.30ish, and then by that time, I've, you know, been aw away all day, and I get to spend time with Robbie, and then before he goes to bed, whereas now... I'm getting to spend so much extra time with him than I would have been while I was training for an Olympics. So the fact that the Olympics have been moved to next year, it takes away that kind of stress of, oh, I need to be training, I need to be getting going. So now at least we know that the Olympics have been moved. It makes it a lot easier for me to be able to plan what I need to do and also make the most of this extra bonus time that I'm getting with Robbie. I know you, you've taken a break uh, previously before, Tom, but will this be the longest time then you've gone without kind of, like you say, that habitual routine that you, you've been in for, for so long with training and, and everything else that comes with that? It's definitely the longest time that I've been out of the pool. I wouldn't, it's not the long, I've still been training like six days a week doing workouts and, um, you know, doing Zoom workouts with my coaches, weights workouts, gymnastic workouts. Uh, lots of online fitness classes. So for me, that's all been very much, you know, part and parcel of what I have to do day to day. Whereas it's definitely the longest time that I've been out of the diving pool, though, because usually I'd be, you know, in the pool every day. Of course. And, and Lance, I, I wanted to ask you, because obviously, like you touched upon it there, you're quite used to almost being locked down when you are writing. So have you, have you kind of almost been more proactive and creative or has it had the reverse effect in that you've probably not been in the right mindset to write given kind of what's been going on? It, it's a really good question because it's, I, I would think I would get even more done and certainly my business is booming right now as, as entertainment does whenever there's a, a tough time in the world or a crisis or an economic downturn. You know, the, famously in the 20s, in the 1920s, there were two lines during the Great Depression, one for the bread and the other to get into a Charlie Chaplin film. So Hollywood is demanding scripts. <laughs> um, and I would think I'd be getting a whole lot done. But it, it does take a certain amount of your focus away. Um, and, and also, I, you know, there, there, there's also, I, I'm surrounded by people. So, and I'm, writers love distraction. We're always looking for a reason to stop writing because it's a bit of torture. It's like a torturous puzzle. So <laughs> I, I am getting a good bit done, but I, but, and, and I wonder if anyone else is experiencing this where the day just feels incredibly short. Time flies right now. And, and I don't know if it's because of the sameness of each day uh, being locked down um, that our minds start to process time differently. And, and, and I, do, I, I do at the end of the day go, where did it go? 
Why isn't I able to make that goal? And I think the first few weeks I was a bit hard on myself and not that I've completely let that go, but I, I'm trying to just accept it, uh, that this is what we're in and time's going to move differently and focus is going to be a bit different, uh, but get done what you can in the time. I also think with this time, there's, there's so many things that you see on social media, of people being really productive and people getting loads done, doing workouts, baking, all that kind of stuff. And actually that can be the most anxiety provoking thing. When you see someone online being so productive and doing all of these things that you think, Oh my gosh, why am I not doing this? I need to be doing that. And that can actually make you more stressed. And actually this time is about coping and about getting done what you need to get done. Um, but you know, do what's best for you to get through this time. You know, there are, I know there's days for me, for example, where I have no motivation whatsoever, but I try not to beat myself up about it too much because this is such a crazy time for so many people. And just try and take each day as it comes is basically what I've been doing. And make so, friends. We, 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 you know, because it, you can fall into the monotony of sameness, we, we, we have gotten better as time has gone by making plans, whether that's a Zoom party or... Um, uh, Baking you know, something in particular. Yeah, knowing that we're not going to go shopping often in order to keep ourselves as safe as possible, but having a plan, like what are we going to cook? What's a new recipe? What's something we can dig up from, you know, our parents' or grandparents' recipes and do that? Or even a date night, which takes a lot of invention when you're locked in a house with a two-year-old. <laughs> But, but, but being able to, to, to do those sorts of things, to just sort of crack it open a little bit um, and, and crack open the sameness a little bit. And, and I guess creating just some form of structure to the days as well is, is kind of something that is, is good to everyone in the world are good, I think. Yeah, exactly. And with Robbie, we try to follow his routine. It's enabled us to make sure that we're going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, breakfast, lunch, dinner, because Robbie needs structure and routine uh, because that's what babies and children like. So I can see how it would be so easy to fall into the trap of staying up late, waking up late, sleeping in and just following whatever your body clock is doing. That doesn't sound like a trap. That sounds like heaven. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Tom's that you just described my last eight weeks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, oh my exactly. God. I, I don't yeah. think we're going to see that trap again until, yeah. you know, he's a teenager. And yeah, you got a while to wait now, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I'd, I wasn't stalking, but I, you know, I was, I was able to spend a bit of time kind of re- reading up on you both. And I've been really excited to talk because you are both individually led really fascinating uh, lives. And then also coming together, it's become even more fascinating. So kind of going way, way back to the beginning, of course, Tom, um, did you always have this love um, for wanting to be in a pool and, and diving or, or was it something else to begin with? Um, you know, I came across diving really by chance. I started swimming from the, a very young age because my, I lived by the sea and my parents wanted me to be safe in the water. Um, but I went to a local swim session with my parents and I saw people diving on the diving board uh, thought it looked really cool and wanted to be able to do it myself, tried it, loved it, was kind of terrified at first. My younger brother was way better than me um, until I kind of decided that actually I was going to stop crying and being scared of everything and just do it. It was a kind of like a sudden flip switch that happened. And then all of a sudden I learned so many new things and got so much better really quickly. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, from then on, I was very much driven to want to go to the Olympics and want to be the best at what I did. I remember when I was nine years old, I had a medal book where I, on each page of the book, I would draw around the medal and then write what age I was, what competition it was, where it was, what place I finished and kind of do a sketch of the medal. And in the front of that book, uh, before when it was kind of like Candidate City, when it was like six cities uh, of who was going to host the London 2012 Olympic Games, I drew a picture of me in a handstand with the Olympic rings saying London 2012. Um, and, you know, as visualization the best it could be and you know my dream came true wow that is that is magic have you still and have you still got the book yeah we've still got the book it's at home in Plymouth I don't have it with me now but yeah it's down in Plymouth and it's kind of yeah it's crazy to think that I you know drew that and it it all happened yeah it's it's one of those it's like crazy but also I can so believe it if you know what I mean yeah it's it's down there the the mindset that you must have had from such a young age, Tom, you know, to be self motivated, uh, driven, the sacrifices that you will have had to make, the the commitment as well. 
where do you think that stems from and how have you managed to sustain that? Um, it's, it's weird because I've never had to think about it. It's something that I think some people are uh, either driven and want to do things and some people don't. And some people have interests in certain things and some people have interests. Like I was always interested in, I wasn't necessarily interested in sports, if I'm being completely honest. Diving was really the only one that I enjoyed doing. I also did judo, but it was like a, diving was such a niche sport. It was it like combined everything that I loved. It was social because you got to be with friends while you were there or you were in the water. There was adrenaline side of it. But to be honest, for me, I was more like I, when I was younger, I was obsessed with all things scary and adrenaline fueled. And uh, I think that was why diving was such a big thing to me because I was never, I'd never enjoyed watching football or rugby or anything like that. It was all about things that kind of frightened me a little bit. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's why I took to diving so, so quickly. Um, um, for, you know, what would be, what are your tips, you know, for, for keeping that self-motivation up and also, you know, having such a, a, a regimented routine and not steering off course and getting distracted, which is so easy to do, I think, particularly in this day and age. Yeah, I think, for, well, for me, I was just, I think the best thing you can do is have some kind of structure, some kind of routine, I try and set myself goals for the day, for the week, then for the month and for the year of what I would like to be able to achieve. Because if you have somewhere where you want to go and somewhere that you want something that you want to achieve, it's so much easier to, um, you know, get up in the morning each day and get up and go and get up and do it because you know that you have to do it. So, you know, yeah, of course, there are days in my diving where I feel like I just want to stay in bed and I can't be bothered to get up and I just want to you know, lounge around and just take the day off. But I know that if I do that, it's going to jeopardize the goals that I've set. And as athletes, it's very much about working as hard as you possibly can and just adapting your training to what you feel like you can achieve without risking injury. And that's something that I've had to learn as an older athlete now, I'm now the oldest on the team, to make sure that I train smart rather than just keep on pushing through and pushing through because this old man is going to get injured. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I have to be careful. <laughs> and uh, Lance, then for you, was, was writing and film production always the area in which you, you knew you wanted to go into growing up? No, I was diving. And I, I <laughs> sketch yeah. in my notepad and said, DLB <laughs> London 2012. And well, it didn't come true for me. Um, <laughs> you got to Rio instead, watching me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to Rio, which was great. The, um, uh, I, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a journey for me. Uh, I, I, I wasn't raised in an area where theater, film, or TV was even a thing that people aspired to do. I was in the middle of Texas, and, and a, a turn of luck that my stepfather got orders to ship out to Central California meant I discovered the theater. And in the theater, I found my tribe and my people. And I don't just mean gay people, but I also met my first gay people. But I met folks who were very expressive and, 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 and storytellers and, um, and you know, folks who were very different than many of the people I was raised around, who were mostly you know, military, Mormon. Um, and I felt at home. And, and, I, and, I, and so then it was an exploration of what in this world of story uh, it, did I, where, where would I find myself? And I'm still, do, I'm still trying to figure that out if I'm being completely honest, just because you, you win certain awards doesn't mean you found your home yet. And, um, and I kind of like it like that. There's a part of me that never really wants to, to figure it out. I yeah. Think. I want to keep moving. So I, I definitely, uh, I, I, I went into, in the theater, I studied lighting and props and scene design. I acted, I flew as John and Peter Pan. I, <laughs> I, I, then, yeah, I then went off and, uh, you know, I went to film school because I wanted a, a second take. And in theater, you don't get take two. And there I studied directing. But when you get out of film school, no one's paying for you to go direct a movie and I had no money. So writing was free, it didn't cost anything. And you know, that's gone quite well. And, and it's those solving those puzzles are fascinating to me. The way that true stories can help move the narrative in, in our culture is really uh, exciting to me. And, and so I, I'm in that right now and, and that and directing and producing more than anything. 
but don't count me out of a return to theater. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, I can hear, hear the crowd already. They're telling for a reprise of John in Peter yeah, Pan. <laughs> yeah. Well, once we are all allowed to go back to live theater, which I hope happens soon, uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to fly as John again. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike my husband, if if terror's involved, I want I want to be far far from it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> terrified. But you know, I'm I'm still figuring myself out. I I hope I can say the same when I'm 90. And if you say, because your, your upbringing and where you were, it kind of hadn't crossed your um, path, so to speak. So was it quite scary to make this leap of faith almost into an entirely different world? One that you knew resonated, but actually maybe wasn't what anyone around you was used to. You were kind of the, the odd one out, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, let's just say I had the opposite of like a theater or film parent. I did because, and, and I think Tom relates to this, like because we came from families that weren't in professional sports and, and weren't in film and TV, you know, I think if anything, we were bringing all this, all these new ideas home. No one really knew how to push us. I think they could encourage us. Uh, but uh, so, so, you know, I, I, it was, yeah, I felt a bit like an adventure. I felt like a scout. <laughs> and sent ahead of, the, yeah, sent ahead of the, you know, of the people who would, you know, you know, were searching for new frontiers to see what was out there. Um, and my mom always loved it. I, I remember, you know, after telling my mother a story of some little like community theater production I had, I had done, she just said, boy, Lance, you, you just opened my eyes to so many new things all the time. And I loved that. That was like the highest praise she may wow. have ever given me. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, th th there was something that I found like, I don't know if it was a common ground for you both, obviously with you being in sport, Tom, and, and Lance with you in entertainment, but in your fields, have they been an outlet for you in that, you know, we, we, when we talk around, you know, mental health and when we process things on our, our well being, have you found that Tom for you with, with diving and being in the pool is a place for you to go and go, right, I can just let myself be and flow in there and same for you in your writing, Lance, can you just let use that as a release almost? I would say diving is the opposite of a release. Yeah. That, is, <laughs> that, is where, that is where all my stress comes from, yeah, really? all of my anxiety. That is where, that's the thing, the only thing in my life where I feel pressure. Whereas it's actually prepared me for life in a way that is so like, you know, that, I mean, at the end of the day, diving is just a game and the Olympics are just a game. It's the Olympic Games, it's uh, the Olympics of all the games combined. So if you think about it like that, the pressure kind of gets taken off and you're like, okay, you know what, it's just a game. We do our best to see if we can win, but it is just a game. Um, but yeah, I would say diving is definitely not, especially when I'm doing all my hard dives off 10 meter, it's definitely not a stress reliever. Um, the thing that I do now actually to relieve stress is knit, uh, believe it or not. So oh. I, yeah, so I've been knitting galore. You should believe it because we have all of the very strange and some beautiful things he's created in the past few weeks. What have you been creating, Tom? What, what have been little scarves, gloves? Um, gloves are actually a lot harder than they look. I've not tried gloves yet, but I've done scarves, I've done hats, I've done a poncho, I've done a jumper, blankets, a few blankets um, a hat for me, a hat for Robbie. Yeah, so I've, I've been making all sorts. I'm currently in the middle of making a cable throw blanket nice yeah i've been i've been really going for it i've got this got this vision of lance and robbie just like sat next to you but all like in all your knitwear like half <laughs> literally we're and heading that direction yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, i just sit there knitting like this <laughs> um, little cup of tea yeah, yeah pretty I, much. that was the dream yeah i can answer it very quickly that it's the same for me my my really work, it's not a no it's um if any i mean listen i do mostly uh, work on true stories uh, where there's often violence involved, politics involved. Um, I've, you know, I, in my research, end up in maximum security prisons talking to murderers. And um, if anything, you know, I find a, it, I, I, my work is a responsibility for me. It's about uh, trying my best to move the needle um, uh, towards social justice. Uh, that's not stress-free. So, Stress relief is something I find outside of work. And, um, you know, and, th and that becomes a, becomes a challenge in lockdown. It's a challenge at any time, but, it, it, you know, 
I, I think like any good therapist has to have a therapist. Any good <laughs> filmmaker, storyteller also needs their therapy, their places to decompress. We work, we work out together. I think so. Like occasionally we go for runs together. And like no. anything that's, any exercise that's not diving related, I find is like a stress reliever. Like if we go for runs or if we do like spin class or we do like workouts together, like anything like that is kind of relieves stress. And, but when it comes to the things that we do um, as our you know, career, it's, that's when it's, it can be stressful. Okay, working out with you is often a stress reliever, but on, <laughs> on occasion, when I see you, I'm going as hard as I can, running, 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 and all I see is you getting further and further in front of you. <laughs> stressful and then when i finally catch up and you haven't you're not sweating you're not breathing deeply and in fact i'm still running at, at the fastest clip i can and i look to my right and you're walking yeah. and you're keeping up with me i did we went for a run the other day and he was just jogging like this i wasn't jogging i was sprinting you were <laughs> And it was like more effort to jog. So I just started walking. Oh. So I just started speed walking. And it was the same as his jog. I'm sweating just thinking about it. It is really um, hot. Lance, you're not alone. I'll be, I'll be at your speed. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come running with you so we feel a bit more normal. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to do a sub 20 minute 5K. And my closest is 20.31 at the minute. That's yeah. still quick, Tom. Yeah, it's that's quick, but it's not, it's not quick enough. It's not quick enough. Lance is 5K. <laughs> Speed, what was 26 and a half minutes? Oh, I can do it in 10 in a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, yeah. Lance has got the six minute mile in his back pocket, just ready to pull out whenever he wants. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned it there, Tom, but um, pressure, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that I think a lot of people have felt, particularly in this two months, have been putting that pressure on themselves and we feel it in our day to day. But I think it's very obviously present in, in both your careers. How how do you deal with that? Because you, you have, you've got such a pressure in, in your spot. And same with you, Lance, with the pressure of, of course, having written brilliant scripts and won awards, is then do you feel the pressure to, you know, you want to kind of deliver on that same level? What, what, how do you deal with that? I think for me, pressure is all about perspective. If you make, for example, when if I'm standing on the diving board, which I have done in the past, thinking that this is it, this is the biggest moment, this is all that I've worked for, this is the moment, if this goes wrong, it's going to be a catastrophe. But if it goes right, it's going to be incredible. This is everything that I've been working for. When actually, diving doesn't define me. It's not who I am. Uh, it's something I do. Mm -hmm. And since having uh, Robbie, Robbie has kind of given me the perspective of what actually matters most. And that's Robbie. And, you know, I can do really well or really poorly in the pool. And then I can come home. And Robbie's not going to care either way whether I've done well or what, if I haven't so just remembering that of what actually matters uh, and that can giving yourself a sense of perspective can often take the pressure off okay. and, and how, how about for yourself Lance um gosh it's just different from day to day to day there are days where I really do I'll admit I start comparing what I'm doing now to the past and that's you know never good it's certainly not creative um plus it's someone who does biography is I, I'm well aware that the past is fiction like we all the memory is this spongy thing and so we may even be comparing ourselves to a past that we're glorifying that makes it even harder so yeah. you know I I I think um you know for the most part I try to be in the moment and trust my gut when I'm actually writing and and for the most part when I'm actually doing the writing or the filmmaking I do forget that there's a context I'm doing it within. Uh, it's usually just like those moments, those seconds after a premiere when you remember all the reviews are gonna come out, that's the danger moment. That's the moment when you might let other people's opinions seep in. It's very, very dangerous. Cool. Uh, and you might start all the comparing. Um, and it, it's just, it's absolutely anti-creative. I'm not gonna lie, I fall into the trap sometimes. Um, and, and then my trick I try is to trust your gut Go with your gut, uh, and and uh, you know not overthink. Uh, that 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 tends to not only get you past the comparing, but it makes the work you know uh, have more life if yeah. you can you can feel it. It has it has more life. So um, and then and then I'm lucky because I keep I have the most schizophrenic career, and it's I guess by design. I just sometimes get bored and I say, well, I maybe I'll write a book this year. 
or maybe I'll, I'll wage a Supreme Court case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, the, uh, so, you, you know, the, in, in that, that sort of schizophrenia of my career does, it keeps mm. everything quite new. And are there any other things that, that you both find uh, you kind of practice or do to, to look after your, your mental well-being and, and health? I mean, we both do practice mindfulness as often as we can, less often now with Robbie. Um, but that was actually the reason why I started knitting before lockdown was to escape from diving, escape from everything, kind of just be really in the moment and mindful of what I was doing right then and there. So actually it's come in handy about when I actually learned to do it because now it's passing a lot of time in lockdown. Um, but you know, it's, I think that's the one thing that I do to try and just switch off from everything. And I think it is important to take time to just be in the moment. And I've been guilty of, you know, looking forward to what's, what's going to be next. When are we going to come out of lockdown? How do we plan? What are we going to do? And actually all you can focus on is what's happening today. You can't think about what's happening tomorrow until you know what's going to happen tomorrow. So mm-hmm. may as well just try and focus on the here and now. Here and now. Yeah. Chocolate. <laughs> I think eating chocolate. Yeah. That's been yeah. the, that's replaced what I used to do and love, which was taking hikes and long walks, which are really focusing, but it, we, you know, there's not a lot of hiking in London. No. I, and right now taking walks is a little stressful because we were supposed to keep some distance and uh, so chocolate. Strong. My chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> The cake. Uh, you guys have the best cho- some of the best chocolate in the world here. So just eating it, you know, right? That's I don't, cool. Okay. Cool too. I'll, I'll we'll, we'll cross paths and when this is all over, and I'll be like four stone heavy, and I'll be like, I stuck to the chocolate, Lance. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, right now we're all just doing the best we can to find our happy places, right? And if on occasion. I would want a little Cadbury's. Well, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Or three bowls of cereal in the middle of the night. Or three bowls of Cocoa Pops at 3 a.m. Lance, high five me on that. That is me all over. Yeah. the most underestimated meal. It goes for any time of day. It's the best. He literally does eat at any time of day. Yeah, that's me. I've done since I was a kid. Um, So so moving to now. So when, um, I mean, how long have you been together? And where, where did you meet? How did you meet? Actually, in two days' time, it, we would have officially been boyfriends for seven years. Wow. Yeah. But we met, we met seven years ago longer. at March. Yeah. So March 2013 is when we met. So yeah, seven years ago. We've been married for three years. In LA. So. We met in Los Angeles. He was there for some award show thing. I was doing like a Nickelodeon Kids Choice or something. I don't know, but like the British version like they have like a couple of british awards that you present but wow. yes i was i was over there for that and we met a, a mutual friend invited me to dinner and lance to dinner and i was really late and he showed up an hour late with like beautiful blonde women dripping off his arms <laughs> they off. it was just the people there like one was my manager one like the rest of us the nickelodeon team they're it gorgeous like, they're yeah gorgeous. Well, they're gorgeous but anyway, we turned up for dinner, got talking, and it was all the small talk about, of, oh, the Olympic Village, we, like, how cool would that, that would make a really fun like, it movie. And I was like, it was such like small talk. It was like- Terrible movie, but you know. It was, yeah, it was all, all the small talk. And then I woke up cute. the next morning to a text from Lance. Well, because he put his number in my phone before I left, because I went back to work, he stayed out. He put his number in my phone, and after the last digit of the number, he put a winky face. What straight man does that in another man's phone? <laughs> Um, and when you say I put it in your phone, you actually got your assistant to go get you. To, yeah, to go and, and I, <laughs> you got your assistant gave me your phone and I put my number in. It, it was a very good move, to be fair, because your assistant was you know, hot. <laughs> and the rest is history as well. Yeah, the rest is history. Um, so, of course, you know, um, ha- ha- married life happened and then you. You also then had the new addition to the family in Robbie. How how has that been? You know, from you know from seven years ago when when you were met to kind of then now married life and now being parents. How have you found the the, the change and the transformation? I mean, it's been massive. I lived in Plymouth and I didn't know anything other than Plymouth, and then you know spent a lot of time in California. Then we ended up moving to London, and so many things have changed. Um, it seems like a lifetime ago, to be honest. I don't know. It's been. At the, some, some instances, it feels like um, it's gone really quickly, but then in others, it's like, oh my gosh, that was like, felt like an eternity ago when we were just... When he's mad at me, it feels like an eternity. That's 
when things are when things are going well, great, it's like a blink of the eye. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you put your mugs in the dishwasher, I wouldn't get yeah, some. Yeah. Oh, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot's changed for me. I, I'm now living in this place where, you know, no one knows how to talk right. <laughs> a boot is something on a car. A lift isn't something for ballet. It's, an, you know, it's something in a building. It's very, very, con the whole thing's very, very confusing for me. <laughs> but, yeah. Have you, um, and, and with that whole new responsibility of parenting, it was interesting, Tom, because you said about it brought you that change in perspective. D did it do anything else, else for you both becoming parents? It, ma it makes me cry at films now. I cry. At, I never used to cry at films, and now I like. It's kind of unlocked a whole different level of emotions, protectiveness. I find like it's it, it's so weird that becoming a parent does change the way that you think about so many things. Yeah. And you just you'll just do anything to protect your family, and it's really quite a. It's a weird. It like literally just like unlocks it, and like this emotion of like you know when I go on planes and we watch films and like I've watched the film before but I watch it this time and as a parent you watch it and you're like oh my gosh and then I'm like why am I crying <laughs> I, I, I mean I literally cry at some of the most random things now and he never used to cry never wow no way I uh I I once had a had a therapist say to me <laughs> Lance one day you are going to learn that you can't control everything and you're going to be so much happier and I was like, well, that's absurd because I can control everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously that's not true. And having a kid is like, makes it crystal clear that you cannot control anything anymore. And so, I mean, having him is, it's sort of about stepping back and letting whatever is happening be. Um, and it, whether you like it or not, there it is. And so just, and it's really been this amazing um, new world of not being able to and not attempting to control everything, just letting things happen and be. I mean, we don't let Robbie like climb up on the you know thing and jump off. <laughs> no, 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 not letting him do whatever he wants. But like you know, I especially in the first year, like we don't you know we're not using some army of nannies, which is fine. Other people do, but we made a decision that we wanted to do as much as we could by ourselves. Um, and so like in that first year, when you'd go off to practice, I'd be home trying to write a book. And I, we had, you know, a Todd, uh, like a kid who was learning to crawl and say little things and run around and had an opinion and wanted to do things. And, you know, in the past, if anyone walked into my office when I was in the middle of the scene, I would get, I would, I'd get kind of angry, as you know. Mm, yeah. Leave me alone. And, it, and then it, you can't do that anymore. It's like, all right, here you are. You are the boss. He's the boss. And like understanding that letting go of control actually is this amazing little secret pathway to happiness. Yeah, and, and I guess also it can be quite freeing as well, actually, I guess. Mm. Terrifying and freeing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask, because you are both, you know, so busy. How do you get that balance of work and then personal you know for your relationship and also also for Robbie out do you have any like little tips and tricks that you use or how, how do you find that balance I mean it starts to get a lot easier now that we sleep trained Robbie and he actually goes to bed at seven and sleeps until seven so we actually have our evenings back now instead of you know spending hours trying to go into bed and yeah. you know, <laughs> it, so that whole ordeal is over but to be honest you know I when I'm home from training it's family time and that's it so I just make sure I focus on that I have a couple of mornings off each week um from training and those are the times where I try and do little bits um, of errands that I need to run for myself but most of the time it's when I'm not training it's family time um, and you know it's just about making sure that at the end of the day my family comes first so with you know there have been occasions where Robbie's been sick and I've had to like take the morning off or to go to the doctor or you know little things like that um, it's just I've just had to, we both had to just adjust the way that we do things now yeah, a strict kind of schedule. And it doesn't mean you're always going to stick to it, but knowing that on the other side of uh, dinner, it's family time and dedicating myself to getting as much done as possible during the week so that my weekends belong to family. 
um, and to fixing things that break and, you know, being a dad. <laughs> Robbie loved, Robbie's favorite at the moment is daddy fix it. He yeah. knows that I can't. <laughs> but he, goes, <laughs> he goes around, he points at light bulbs and things like daddy fix it. And I'm like, yeah, daddy fix daddy it. Fix. Yeah, when that toolbox <laughs> comes out. Perfect he's point. Yeah, he, he, loves the, he loves when the toolbox he comes out. He gets, so he try, like, goes with a screwdriver and tries to like screw things and like Stop. think, hey, Bobby fix oh, it, yeah. Bobby fix it. Oh, he calls yeah. himself Bobby as well, which is really cute. He's like Bob the Builder then, really. He's yeah, exactly. Bob, he's he really Bob, is. The yeah. Bob the Builder. Um, final question, gents, is um, given that it is the Happy Place Festival, where is your happy place? Oh, but it's funny you say that because my, if you had asked me last year, before all of this, I would have said my happy place is sat at in somewhere in California beside a beach, waves crashing, mm. margarita in hand, mm. sat there with Lance and Robbie and Robbie playing in sand castles and things like that. That would be my happy place. Whereas now my happy place is on the sofa with a cup of tea, my knitting needles and some yarn. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's me. What about you? Oh gosh, what is that? What is that? There's so many ways to define the happy place. There um, is. Where Where are you most um, calm? Would you say, or present and peaceful? Where you're not worrying or stressing about anything? Where are you like at your happiest? <laughs> I mean, I, my happiest is pretty stressed and not very calm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, when I'm in production and I'm going to give you a couple answers, but when I'm in production, w meaning we're filming and I'm directing, it's sort of like juggling razor blades that are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and I find it so joyful and exciting. I'm so happy there. I, I don't know why, but it's, but that is a very, very, that's a certain kind of a happy place because I feel like I'm in a position where I can push that giant needle um, in our world a little closer towards equality to justice and understanding. That's a really exciting happy place for me. Um, you know, if I'm a warrior, it's my happy place is doing that battle. Um, but in order for that to happen, I also have to have the peaceful moments. And what you just described about, there is, a, there is actually a beach that I've taken you to in California near Big Sur that I used to go to when I was a little closeted teenage boy and thought that the world never would understand me, would never embrace me. And I would sit there, I get tearful thinking about it. I would sit there and watch the waves crash in this really amazing way there where it looks like they're gonna get you, but there's a huge undertow, a strong undertow. And it takes them right back out. These massive waves that look like they're going to take you out and then they're just gone. Wow. And, and I just loved sitting there watching those uh, just for hours and hours on that pebbly beach. Uh, and I felt like I was a part of something bigger. And, uh, and that's a very, that is a different kind of happy place for me. Uh, so either juggling fire or sitting on that beach that I hope we can go back to. I've taken you there. Yeah, I know, I remember, I remember. Um, it's not beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. I'll uh, I'll have to check that one out. Any of them places though, even on a on a on a production set, I can get that whole thing of as well of it being a buzz, you know, feeling alive and everything's kind of on that one moment. It's uh yeah. yeah any of them sound good. Knitting, the beach, or on a film set. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, guys, thank you so much uh, for, for your time and, and just for, for speaking so openly and honestly. It's been so lovely to chat and, and kind of, you know, put the world to right with you. So appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Have a yes. Thank you. If you like that video, there are loads more talks, classes and exclusive videos from the Happy Place Virtual Festival. So don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Do follow us on Instagram for constant updates and enjoy.